So ladies and gentlemen, to bring us closer together tonight and to share this reconciliation of cultures, I am extremely proud to introduce to you Brule and the American Indian Rock Opera. Occasionally, an event occurs of such significance that it forever changes the way you perceive life itself. As though a veil has been lifted and the clarity and purpose of your life become obvious. In November 1993, such an event occurred for my family and I. I was one of the Native American children who was adopted at birth, removed from the reservation, and uh, grew up without any knowledge of my, of my um, heritage. I was raised by two wonderful adoptive parents. And I grew up in this small, white, middle-class farming community in southwest Minnesota. My brother and I uh, grew up without the knowledge of our heritage. Well, you see, we were told that we were adopted. Uh, both of us knew that as young boys, but uh, the strange little twist in our story is that we were never really told that we were uh, Native American. And I think there was a reason for that. See, back in those days, it was still taboo to openly proclaim that you had Native American descent or lineage in your family tree. And that's all changed these days. But I believe, thinking back on it, um, I think our parents did that as kind of a protective device. Uh, there wasn't such a thing as cultural diversity back at that time. And so, you know, perhaps the information that uh, we were the only two Native American children in that town, um, it may have been damaging information. I believe that our parents gave us that information uh, out of love. They just left out the little part that we were Native American and told us that we were French Canadian, which in fact was partially correct. One evening I received a phone call out of the blue, you might say, and on the other end of the line was a gentleman who introduced himself as my biological brother. His first words to me were, hey bro, you are Lakota. You see, neither of us know, had known that the other had existed all those years. And so we um, had a long conversation and uh, exchanged our life stories. Uh, it certainly would have been different had I remained on the reservation. Well. At the end of the conversation, he said something that really forever changed the course of our lives. Uh, he said, come on home, come on home. Thanks to my wife, Kathy, I was reunited with my biological family on Thanksgiving day of 1993. To say it was a life-changing moment in time is an understatement of the greatest magnitude. We were given a grand homecoming and in the blink of an eye became part of a new culture and a new world. It was the music from the two worlds that was to become the inspiration for the sight and the sound of Brule. After our reunion with Paul's family on the Lower Brule Sioux Reservation, they encouraged Paul to get back into music and to write from his heart. From that point on, I read uh, in Indian Country Today magazine or newspaper uh, article about a Native American recording company, you know, which is Sound of America Records down in Albuquerque. I contacted them, made arrangements for a meeting, and from that point on, signed contract and and got ready for Paul to take off to go down and record his first CD, the fall of 1994, I believe. And at that point, that left the kids and I um, to pack up our belongings at the apartment in Eden Prairie, and, and um, we all found friends to help us. Um, during that period, Paul was gone for about six months. I stayed with a friend, Shane had a friend he stayed with, and Nicole did as well. 
So it was a pretty tough period of time for all of us while Paul was gone for about six months. And when he came back in January, I believe, uh, 1995, with his first CD, We the People, um, we listened to it, and at that point we knew um, somehow we had to get the music out into the world. And at that point, I realized after I heard um, Paul's brother saying when we first met them in 1993 that we needed to come home. Well, of course, at that point we weren't ready, but then at that it hit me really hard and I knew that was the time then we did need to move back home to the reservation to start all over uh, to, get, to help get the music out. After recording our first CD, we began to rehearse at our little reservation house on the prairie. Without any help from the outside music industry, Kathy began to book appearances at art shows, malls, and small town events across the Midwest. Well, we began um, performing at small craft shows and malls wherever they would um, open the doors for us to set up and perform in. And it was really neat to see um, the reaction to people because we were scared to death not knowing what was going to happen and um, it was really interesting how people would try to walk by and listen and keep going on to continue on with their shopping but uh, so many times people would stop look try to walk and then they couldn't continue on and then they'd stop and 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 stay practically all day uh, to listen and I remember one gentleman actually came up to the table as he tried to walk away numerous times and he looked at me and he said um, okay you talked me into it and and uh, and I hadn't really said anything but um, it was actually the music talking to him and over time as we performed all over in bigger malls and starting to get into bigger events we started getting phone calls letters um, from people from all wa walks of life that um, were telling us how the music had affected them uh, for the better, um, spiritually, um, a lot of different things, and, and that then we knew that for that we had to continue on with this music because it was um, doing good. It was helping people um, either spiritually or for whatever reason, and that's why we are doing what we're doing. The stockade would start at about ten, you know, 10 usually two thirty in the morning, getting a call to go down and. Tarp, of this up, tarp up the gear because it's hailing and pouring and flooding and then once the storm passes then I uh, you know make sure everything works get back go back to sleep for an hour come back to the stockade get it all dried off a fire up and start playing and then bikes and hamburgers and stuff start flying past and you're playing all day and we carved out a circuit where none existed and learned how to survive as independent artists the circuit began to grow and so did the band but the core members were always my son Shane, my daughter Nicole, and our friend Velasquez. We used the traditional Native American drum to heighten the cultural experience. In doing so, we became one of the first groups to use the sacred traditional drum in a contemporary setting, which we did with the blessing and guidance of the elders. Through the years, there's definitely been, for me, a big thing to battle and deal with um, is people's perception of what you know, there's always, as an artist on stage, a musician, there's, um, especially if you're representing a message or a culture, there's definitely an image that people want in order to accept. And then there's, you know, an understanding as an artist that you have to give them some of it in order to say that you're giving it respect or people know what it is you're trying to do other than just music. As the years passed, the show expanded to include nieces, nephews, cousins, and even our own grandchildren. Hi, I'm Jade Summers. I am a jingle dress dancer. I have been dancing since I was three. By this time, the group had received numerous awards and recognition, and we set our sights on going to the next level, which is the world of the performing arts theaters, music festivals, and foreign tours.
I was one of the Native American children adopted at birth and removed from our country's Indian reservation system. I was raised in a small middle-class farming community but was never told of my true American Indian heritage. It was still taboo back in those early days. The years passed and in 1987 I lost both parents. While going through their personal belongings, my wife discovered my adoption papers and she began a search. Five years later, I was reunited with my biological Lakota family living on the Lower Brule Sioux Indian Reservation of South Dakota. I am a son of two mothers and a product of two worlds that have collided. But I have an equal amount of love and pride for both. I'm Paul LaRush and the stories you are about to see are an attempt to share this true American story of a hidden heritage. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Mount Rushmore. My name is Gerard Baker, and I want to tell you right now, do shabitagoa. We wanted to do something larger than life at a grandiose location, and we couldn't think of a better place than Mount Rushmore to deliver our message of reconciliation of the cultures. South Dakota. Thank you. Mount Rushmore in these beautiful and sacred black hills has many meanings to many peoples. I think for me, first and foremost, right now, because of what we're experiencing in our fight against terrorism, having our men and our women fighting for us, this represents our freedoms. We couldn't find anyone in the music industry who supported or believed in the idea. The financial investor backed out at the last minute and so we decided, a day before the show, to produce the concert on our own. It was a free concert, and we didn't have the funds. We've had some pretty negative times. Negative times of removal, for example, moving people from these beautiful areas to reservations. A time period when, as we mentioned last night, back in those days, we couldn't do this as Indian people. We couldn't sing, we couldn't dance. We couldn't even pray sometimes and have ceremony because it's illegal. How far we've come. What I encourage people to do to get together is to never, never forget about the past. But also, we will still continue to have tremendous hope for the future. So that we will never again have to do that. So that our children can play side by side, no matter what color they are, no matter what language they speak and no matter what background they come from. That we can get away from the terms and the activities related to racism and prejudice. Looking back on it now, it was the riskiest thing that we'd ever done and the most expensive. It set us back financially by years. But we would come to realize that it was the catalyst for everything that was to happen from that point forward. Again, the reality is that we have a ways to go. It is places like this and it is events like this that can truly bring us close together as human beings. Because again, we are one people. We are equal. We are equal to walk on this earth. We are equal to be free as we see it in America. So with those thoughts in mind, I encourage you to keep teaching your children about who you are. I don't care what color we are, ladies and gentlemen, we should never forget our cultures. I don't care if we're American Indian, American German, American Norwegian, African American, Hispanic, and so forth. Number one, we are human being. Number two, we are American. And above all that, we are free. It would remain the pinnacle of our mission for reconciliation of the cultures to this day. So ladies and gentlemen, to bring us closer together tonight, 
and to share this reconciliation of cultures. I am extremely proud to introduce to you Brule and the American Indian Rock Opera. So ladies and gentlemen, to bring us closer together tonight and to share this reconciliation of cultures, I am extremely proud to introduce to you Brule and the American Indian Rock Opera. The show was tour ready, but the mainstream music industry still couldn't figure out what to do with us. There were no takers. But the audience continued to grow. So now we had to learn how to produce and promote our own shows as we entered the world of the performing arts theaters. It wasn't for the weak of heart, but we did learn as we went. And the show moved up to the next level. The show was so unique that it became our strength and our weakness. The live show was always driven by the cultural visual aspect. Our lead instrumentalist, Nicole, the music, and the mission, and not in any particular order. Brule and Arrow present the American Indian Rock Opera 2009. The most dynamic Native American performance touring today. A powerful and uplifting experience. Become part of the excitement that's sweeping the nation. Brule and the American Indian Rock Opera. And then things really got difficult. The group moved to the RFD TV Theater in Branson, Missouri for the start of a three-year run. We had to learn how to cope with the egos of an 18-member cast performing two shows a day, five days a week. There were issues every single day as members changed. We incorporated vocals for the first time. And we included a traditional Native American drum song that became a big hit. It was a tribute to our veterans. Most people don't realize that even though there are over 550 Native tribes, combined we are still the smallest minority. But even though we're the smallest minority, we have the largest number of men and women per capita that enter the military and the armed services every single year. At this point, the show included a semi, three smaller trucks and trailers, and a tour bus. 
and we were still promoting and producing the show on our own. It took from sunrise to sunset to set the show up, rehearse, and to perform a one-hour show. By this time, we had surpassed anything the music industry could have done for us. And in fact, the industry was trying to copy our sound and the look. Now we had to contend with imposters, pirates, and event promoters that didn't know how to handle our show. And then came the next level. Performing with full symphony orchestra, this opened up the door to national exposure with PBS, RFD TV, and many other national markets. Ironically, our Native American holiday show always remained our most popular show. And now with full symphony scores, the concert soon rose to the ranks of one of the top holiday concerts in the country. Brule had come a long way from the small Midwest farming community of Worthington, Minnesota and our tiny home on the Lower Brule Sioux Indian Reservation of South Dakota. Over the past 25 years, Brule has presented over 3,000 concerts, recorded 23 CDs, traveled across America, around the world, and built a cast that included over 100 musicians and dancers. The mainstream entertainment industry has yet to recognize the spiritual significance of the Native American culture, and has yet to include us in the entertainment industry. We have come a long way but there's still a ways to go. We have opened the doors so that the next generation can carry on the plate. To this day, there is still no category for Native American music in the Grammy Association. The laws of economics have dictated for years that the poorest areas will yield the lowest number of successful individuals. And it's only a myth that all tribal nations have accumulated great wealth. The reservations of South Dakota our home of some of the poorest counties in America. It's a miracle that we have come as far as we have. We had beaten the odds, and maybe it was the grand design of things. In 2017, we were invited to come back to Worthington, my hometown, and for the first time perform with the local community orchestra. It was a 60-year closure to an unbelievable life journey and a return to the place where it all began. It took traveling to Saudi Arabia in 2018 by invitation to realize the true appreciation and respect for what the Native American culture has to offer the world. It was a reception like we've never seen before. 
The evolution of the Brule cast members is now complete. With Velocious back on guitar, Nicole at lead, Shane at home on the drums, and myself comfortable at the keyboards. And a dance troupe of family and friends. I'm Paul LaRush, and this is Hidden Heritage.